Well, hey there, idiots. Welcome back to Observe and the third installment of the case centered around Elisa Lam at the Cecil Hotel. Now, I have already done two episodes on the manager of the Cecil Hotel herself. If you want to go and watch those, feel free to do so. I have linked them in the description below. But another one that I was highly requested to do would be directed towards some of the detectives involved in the investigation centered around Elisa Lamb's disappearance. Now, for those of you who don't know, there are many theories, often conspiracy theories, centered around Elisa Lamb's disappearance because there are a lot of odd occurrences during this case. One of the theories is that she was in fact killed by one of the people at the hotel itself and there was an attempt to cover that up. I addressed that somewhat in the previous two videos. Another theory is that perhaps ghosts were involved, which I'm not going to address because I still have yet to find evidence for ghosts, so I'm not gonna spend time on this channel. There is another theory that perhaps Elisa Lam was used as a form of homeless population control. And that is largely born out of the idea of a tuberculosis outbreak in the area shortly after her death. Now, this is all brought up because, in fact, a test for tuberculosis is called the Lam Elisa test, which is short for this massive word here that I'm not even going to try to pronounce because I do value my sanity on some level, but that has been largely disproved by the toxicology reports and the autopsy that was done after she was recovered. Now, during all of this, we're taking the word of the people in charge for what it is. We're assuming that they're telling us the truth. We're assuming that what we have is genuine. Today, I'm gonna to be looking at one of the lead detectives on the case and the one who displayed the most unusual nonverbal communication, breaking down what his tells are allowing us to see as far as his emotional state, seeing if there are any possibilities for deception, and then we'll wrap everything up at the very end with some of my opinions and what can be drawn for what we have already witnessed. Now, I have gone through the entire series and found all the footage of this gentleman's face and taken out all of the extra B-roll to see if I could avoid Netflix's copyright system. I have not been having a great streak of luck with copyright, so if you would like to be able to make more videos like this possible, there are a few ways you can do that. You can follow any of the links down in the description below to either purchase merch, to become a patron, or to sign up for Audible. All three of those are very, very useful for the channel and they help support me when large corporations claim all of the revenue from my videos. That's enough talking, let's roll the intro and then we'll start on the analysis. So during this first part, we're going to be looking at some of the nonverbal communication that displays itself while the gentleman is responding to more basic questions. And this will help us establish a rough and emphasis on the rough baseline of his normal nonverbal communication. This is essential for being able to establish more authentic and accurate tells later on. If you skip this step, it becomes less accurate. Let's watch. My name's Tim Marsha. I was a detective with the Los Angeles Police Department. One morning, we were told that we had picked up a missing persons case. She was a young female from Canada, traveling throughout California by herself, and there was a sense of panic. So something that I wanna point out about the general resting state of his face is that his eyes are intense. That is something that we can see is just part of his baseline non-verbally. So intensity of eyes is not going to be a real great tell for us later on because it exists already in a very basic area of the interview. So we have to kind of keep that in mind moving forward. However, beyond that, he's also emoting regularly. You can see his eyebrows move fully, his face moves fully. This leads me to believe that he hasn't had anything like Botox or anything that will freeze his muscles during the interview, which means more or less that I can have a more reliable read on his face as the interview progresses. So there was probably about 18 detectives uh, from Robbery Homicide Division uh, that responded. The employee that had bagged up her belongings said that the room was in disarray, as in messy, but not as in foul play. 
Something else that I want to note about his bass line non-verbally is the tone and pitch of his voice as he's speaking here. We can hear where it's resting, it's not too strained, and it's not super low. It's sitting right here in the upper mid range of pitch and tone. This just means that whenever we see it spike either positively or negatively from there, it's a red flag for us. We should be asking more questions, but this is where his tonal bass line lies. Another important thing to establish this early on, Let's continue. There was no evidence of forced entry into the room. There was no paraphernalia for drugs. But I remember feeling instinctively that this does not feel like it's going to end well. So he does a lip compression there at the end, which is a semblance of biting back words or emotions. That specific mini expression pops up regularly for many, many people. There's not too much you could read into that specific expression, besides that there's a lot more that comes along with what he said there. Also, he mentions that instinctually he felt like something was wrong, and this plays into the idea of intuition, instincts, how do those play out, and what's the scientific method behind instincts, what's the reason for the gut feeling, as many will say, and there's a lot to unpack during this. I have covered that in videos earlier on in my channel, so you can go and find those, but I will also be continuing that research and study further on the channel here as time progresses, speaking to more experts to be able to establish what intuition could possibly be. And can you train it? Can you learn from it? And can you use it in day-to-day -day life? Can it become a reliable tool rather than a gamble of whether or not it's going to be reliable? That all being said, let's continue with this interview. Right now, we have a 21-year-old who's lost somewhere in the city we knew that she was in danger. Me personally, as a parent and a daughter who was 19 at that time, I think, you have a flash. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about his expressions and gestures during this specific time. He's saying we knew that she was in danger and he's nodding along with that. That's being synchronized across both words and gestures. This lends me to believe that he's being authentic here and there's no reason for me to doubt him. Likelihood is they knew that she was in danger just because of that gut feeling when you've done something for so long, your subconscious brain will be trained to pick up on patterns. And if that is the case here, then he would likely know without knowing why he knew that this was not a good case. Also, in regards to his recollection, you can see him look up and off to the side, something that I wanna make super clear. In pop science, so to speak, there is this false idea that depending on the direction that you look, you're either remembering authenticity or you're lying and it's been totally proven wrong. People will look whatever direction they want to to be able to remember whatever it is they want to. Maybe there might be times that if a person's thinking about an auditory thing, they'll look closer to the side rather than up or down or something like that, but it's very, very rarely, and it's not nearly enough to be reliable. So during this time, we can assume that while he's recollecting, if he looks up and off to the side, it's gonna be genuine recollection. Also, he has no reason to lie about the age of his daughter. This helps us understand later on if there's a period where he's supposed to be recollecting and he looks perhaps differently, then that could be a possible desynchronization point from this time. This is a baseline establishing point for us and can be useful later on throughout the rest of the interview. That there's some type of connection to your own family. Let's just pray that we find her. We decided, okay, we have to watch this minute for minute. My partner and I were assigned that task. Management gave us a little office and we sat there uh, for 20 hours a day watching video. We focused on the night of Elisa's disappearance. The last thing you want to do is miss something. It was just a laborious, laborious task. And all of a sudden, we see her on camera. So during this time, he's still not showing any desynchronization points. Everything as he's speaking is very conversational. And this is establishing more baseline, more or less. We're able to see how he is still speaking genuinely. He also has no reason to be lying here. If there's going to be a conspiracy, it's not this early on. Also, another interesting thing is that he indeed is asking all of the right questions and going through all of the correct processes. And that's good to see. That means that he is a good detective and he's doing his job well. He hasn't shown any areas of wanting to skim over them because he sees them as unimportant despite all of it being quite important. So that's just good to see that he is in fact an authentically good detective doing his job well. 
and we both just jumped and both went to, to hit pause on the uh, DVR and he beat me to it because he's younger. It was- So this part, you could see him doing a forced smile on the lower half of his face. That means that it's most likely fake when a person has a fake emotion. It's hard for them to have synchronization across their entire face and body. And that comes out in a smile reaching only the mouth, maybe to the corners of the nose, but never up to the eyes. Or there's a mixture therein and there's a smile down here and there's anger or fear or disgust or something along those lines up top. It's this desynchronized concept. This pops up here and that means that he's forcing the humor here, which is common in recollecting dark events. People who recollect things that are not happy will oftentimes try to insert jokes or happiness to help lighten the mood not only for the people they're talking to, but for themselves as well. That's expected, that's not abnormal. Let's keep watching. A moment of excitement because it's something to work with. It's a piece. But I remember talking to my partner and say, her behavior is unusual. So we sat there and we, we watched the video several times and then plotted out where she could have gone to try to figure out if she left, when she left, and if she left with somebody. In reviewing all the footage and watching the, the exiting and entrance, we never saw her leave. So you can see a little bit of shame here and a little bit of sadness pop in. When you look down and off to the side, it's common and shame, but then also you can see with the slight movement of his eyebrows and therefore also affecting his eyelids, a slight bit of sadness as well. And this is related to the story that he's speaking about. This means that when we see his nonverbal communication, it is in relation to the emotions that he's feeling. This likely, this pushes me to believe that he is likely not a good liar. A person who emotes very well with the words that they're saying oftentimes is not a good liar, unless they're practiced at it, which I don't know him. He might be. He might be a practiced liar. But assuming that he is not, this means that he is likely a bad liar. That's good news for us because if he lies later on, then we'll likely be able to catch it and call him out on it. And we communicated that to our peers, that we felt that she's still here somewhere. She never left the hotel. She never left the hotel. So. Another lip compression, biting back emotion or other words. Once again, this is common. And lip compressions are rarely related to positive emotions. Nobody ever has a lip compression centered around, I have so much joy and happiness that I'm going to try to bite it back. It's almost always centered around a negative emotion. So whether that's sadness or whether that's frustration or whether that's anger, it's not possible to tell from the lip compression itself, but judging off of the rest of his face, I would lend it towards sadness and frustration. And those also make sense in the context of the interview itself. If she never left, then where could she be? Or who within the hotel could be a potential suspect? Who could have either hurt Elisa or has her under their control? It was decided that we would call out. That's an interesting facet that he just had there. Who either hurt Elisa or, and then he looks off to the side, does an eye block and says, had her under her control. This doesn't mean anything in and of itself, but it is a red flag. This is a burst. This is a positive spike in his baseline that doesn't show up earlier where he's talking about more casual things. If I were in the privileged spot of being the interviewer here, I would have asked more about why he said specifically that. Why did you say had her under their control? Why are those the words that you chose? And eventually we would be able to chip away at the truth. So there's not enough for us to know from it here, but it is absolutely a red flag. Maybe it'll pop up later on and help us understand why he referred to it the way he did. Needless to say, his psychological processing is showing us that there's something more around that specific area of his story. Ergo, the burst of nonverbal activity on his face with the look away, the eye blocking, and the lip compression. Scent tracking dogs. They will take an item such as a piece of clothing, a sock, something that will pick up the person's scent. You get that little heartbeat, like, 
oh, we might be onto something. On the fifth floor, the dog track. So this area, he has a little bit of happiness or excitement enter his eyes. Both of those can look very, very similar when you're looking exclusively at the eyes. In this context, it makes more sense to be reflecting on and perhaps remembering the excitement of that moment. You have that little burst of excitement because of dot, 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 and his face is reflecting that. Once again, just hammering home this idea that he probably is not a good liar. So that means that if he lies later on, we're more and more and more likely to catch him out on it in a westbound direction towards a big window that looks out from the hallway onto the street. And outside the window, there is a fire escape. By that time, everybody was on overtime, probably going into 14 to 16 hour day. A team of detectives with canines was assigned to search the roof. So they called in LAPD Air Support Division and they had them illuminate the top of the hotel using the, their night sun. And Okay, so during this time, his pitch and tone is also staying constant. There's no inflections or dropping of pitch or anything centered around possible deceit or at least change of emotion that could point us in the direction of possible deceit. All throughout this, he is simply recounting events as they happened. And during this instance, I would actually believe him. I don't see any tells of inauthenticity. He's not lying as far as I can tell. There's not even points of desynchronization that would point me in that direction. Let's continue watching. They searched up there for, for Elisa and or evidence and didn't find anything. It had gotten late in the evening. So during this time he has a prolonged blink, a lip compression, and then he also shakes his head no. Now that specific cluster is sort of contradictory on certain levels and then it also makes sense on other levels. So on certain levels, the eye block and the lip compression imply that he's blocking himself from the thought, in this case, of what he's talking about. But then the head shake is synchronized with what he was saying. So my question would be, why would it be possibly desynchronized there? And the actual answer is, is that it's not. The fact of the matter is, is that blocking gestures and lip compressions are simply biting back words and separation from a negative connotation. And in this case, he knows that they missed something in that area. He knows that when they went up to the roof the first time, he missed the body. So while he's recollecting it, he will show signs of either shame or frustration or a desire to block himself from that moment because he knows that everybody failed on that front. There was a body up there and they were so close and they missed it. So biting back negative emotions and then also eye blocking during that time with the head shake is synchronized. This is where you have to be able to understand the entirety of the interview in context rather than just looking at one small little facet at a time. So in the context, this makes sense, but out of context, it could be seen as a red flag. It was close to 10 p.m. at night and it was decided that the following day uh, we would regroup, but the following morning after the search, the LAPD went on tack alert because a different investigation came into play. Christopher Dorner was a former Los Angeles police officer. LAPD was under attack by one of their own. A blink and look away there that shows negative emotions centered around that specific name which makes sense. He probably didn't like the person from the LAPD going and killing people in the LAPD. That would have some negative connotations of so that specific little tiny spike in his baseline makes sense. So the next morning it was decided that the two lead investigators with myself and my partner would stay on the Lisa Lamb case while everybody else, was, their primary responsibility was the Dorner investigation, which was a higher priority. So we went from... Another lip compression there, likelihood is he was frustrated by that. It's never fun to be in charge of something and then have all of the support removed. And it was a large team and then suddenly it's just this little tiny squad of people trying to solve this missing person's case. So he probably had some negative emotions centered around that, frustration, disappointment, so on and so forth. But he also used very formal language during that. It's a higher priority, blah, blah, blah. That means that he knew why they did what they did, but he didn't like 
why it had to happen. And it also strikes me as odd. I wanna make sure that you know this is my opinion area here. It strikes me as odd that right when they're trying to make headway on this case, something else pops up that it erases their support, their ability to do it well. That would be a frustration and it is odd just in timeline period here. And there are many odd things about this case. This is simply one of them that a large team that was in charge of investigating it was suddenly diverted elsewhere. This is just my opinion. There's nothing that really backs this up. I just find it as odd. About 18 detectives down to four. And that changed the dynamics of our investigation. And since there was no information that was developed out of the canvas, now we're back to square one. We need the public's help to put more eyes out on the street. The last footage that we had of Elisa before her disappearance was the footage we found of her inside the elevator. So it was decided that we would release the video. So he has a cringe expression, release, and then the corners of his mouth pulled downward. This is also a mini expression of fear. It's showing that he doesn't appreciate that decision. There's a negative connotation to that, and he's about to explain why, but speaking non-verbally, we can already see that he regrets it. Ergo, the mini expression of fear on the lower half of his face. He did, quote unquote, an oopsie there. We owe it to the family to find her. We don't have the resources. It was a no-brainer, so we put it out. Um, Another look down of shame and eye blocking during this. He's not happy with this decision to put it out into the public. He's shown fear, he's shown blocking, and he's shown shame all centered around this. Chances are if he could go back and do it again, he would not have released it to the public. Let's see why. That's where the case starts to go askew. At this point of the investigation, a little bit of contempt slips into his face and that small lopsided smile, that's where the case begins to go askew. And here in we have the truth. He regrets releasing it to the public because then it goes askew. After we've released the video, it just blew up in the media because her behavior on the elevator was, was unusual. When we first watched it, my partner and I were just sitting there staring at it. At one point, I remember talking to my partner and say, how many buttons did she push? And he goes, I think she punched a bunch of them. And all of a sudden it's like, oh wow, this is interesting. In talking to the hotel, her behavior was somewhat unusual over a period of a few days, whether it's drugs or if there's something else going on. We all felt that. So that's an important part, or if there's something else going on, and he doesn't do anything that would indicate deception. He doesn't do any blocking gestures. His pitch does increase lightly though. That's important to note, that his pitch does increase there, but that also flows in cadence with his words. It's far from enough to be incriminating towards deception, and oftentimes during these sorts of reads, there isn't enough to be incriminating towards deception. There is so much that goes into an accurate nonverbal read that the person who is doing the reading should have some power over the questions being asked. Because when you see a spike, like I saw earlier, there was a spike and I would have asked more questions, it should be the job of the nonverbal analyst to be like, hey, we need to ask more questions there or I'm going to ask more questions there. I don't get that privilege here so there's never gonna be enough. And I know that there are a lot of people that are on the internet that say that there's always gonna be enough, and there's just not. There's really just not. The science of nonverbal communication reading is still so new and so unknown due to the fact that we still just don't know the human mind. We just, we can't figure it out. So until we can figure that out, we're never gonna know what the human mind is displaying non-verbally, maybe eventually with tools like AI or a lot more research or scientific discovery in relation to the human mind, that might open those doors. But for now, we are still quite limited in regards to deciphering deception. Emotion, we can decipher pretty well. Deception, it's a little bit more muddy. Now we're looking for somebody in a state of mind that could render her more vulnerable 
to someone taking advantage of her. So our level of concern starts going up. This is good for his character. He has a little bit of disgust when talking about somebody taking advantage of her. You can see that in the action around the corners of his nose. That is an indicator of disgust. It's a little micro slash mini expression. We had no idea how long Elisa had been in the tank. At that point, we're all looking at each other like, okay, how and when did she end up here? You know, it's not making sense. More disgust and a lip compression. He's angry and disgusted centered around this specific question. This can be pointed outward at whoever did this or how it could have been caused, and it could also be pointed inward at not catching it earlier. Regardless, we see that emotion. We understand what he's feeling during this time. We checked the roof. We felt confident that she wasn't there. This is a massive gesture and expression of shame. He shows his frustration with a heightened level of pitch and tension in his tone. We check the roof, and then he starts using lip compressions again, head shakes, and then he looks down in this massive expression and gesture of shame. He's very disappointed in himself for this. He's been on the force for XYZ years. He should have caught this, and he's very disappointed in himself. A lot of us should be able to get to his emotional state during this time. Whenever you have a situation, sadness in his eyebrows and eyelids as well, as well as the corners of his mouth being pulled downwards, he's ashamed and he's frustrated and he's saddened by that entire incident. Understandably so. Like this, we investigate the case as a homicide until it's not. When Elisa Lamb was found, she was naked, um, clothing was found at the bottom of the tank at that time because we had no idea why she ended up in the water tank. Her body becomes a piece of evidence, and I, I feel bad for saying it that way, but we have a responsibility, and the body will speak to you. We have kind of a strange thing. He's still maintaining this somber, sad expression centered around the setting of his eyelids and the corners of his mouth. They're all encouraging me to see that he is genuinely upset and saddened and somber about that situation. He takes no joy in that. That's good to see because it just means that he's a moral person, which also pushes me to believe that if he lies later on, we will be far more likely to see it going on here in that there was nothing to support that a crime of violence occurred. There was no physical evidence found. Looking back at my career after 34 years, there was no physical evidence found. This also falls into the resignation blink that I mentioned in earlier videos, and then it's an accenting head nod as well. So this implies that he's really trying to hammer home that there was no evidence Found. And he's not adding any extra words in there. He's not adding extra details. It's not feeling like he's really trying to convince us of that. He just states that there was no evidence found. And that is an indicator of authenticity. The Elisa Lamb case was extremely unusual and it raised all different types of questions. How did she end up here? In a water tank on the roof of the Cecil Hotel. Do we have a crime here? who within the hotel could be a potential suspect. The investigation was ongoing, but at that time, we weren't able to find evidence that other guests or hotel employees would have been a danger to her. My partner and I decided. So he says at that time, implying that at a different time, they were. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said, at that time, we weren't able to find anything. That strikes me as interesting, just as a verbal pattern in and of itself but he also isn't showing any signs of deception here. So he's still being authentic, AKA he's being synchronized. When I'm saying that he's being authentic, it means that he's being synchronized. I'm not seeing any massive amounts of nonverbal disalignment that would give me a heads up for it. So just for future notice, keep that in mind. Authentic means synchronized and there's always the chance, there's always the chance for error during this. Nonverbal communication reading at best is 70 to 80% accurate, but in this point, it does feel as if he's being synchronized. That we would 
go back and review all the videotape from the hotel to recreate her whereabouts and interactions with people. We sat there and we, we watched the video several times and we discovered there was some footage that showed her coming into the hotel and she was with two guys by looking at the footage. During this time, his eyebrows are furrowed and his eyes are squinting lightly. This is an expression of recollection, genuine recollection. He's recalling what he saw at that time. Notice that he's not looking any special direction because once again, that theory, that idea, that concept of directional IQs is actual garbage. So during this time, he is showing an actual expression of recollection. This has been established by pattern finding AI over thousands and thousands of samples of people recollecting things, authentically recollecting. This AI found this pattern with no external influence. Nobody said, look for it. It just said, find patterns. This is what happens. This is how I know that this is a genuine expression of recollection. We were able to conclusively verify an exchange of a box that one of the males was carrying. Elisa takes control of the box and then she continues on into the hotel with the box and the two males turn around and leave, which was an interesting development because did she know these people? Maybe they had something to do with Elisa's death. The box led us to the last bookstore in downtown Los Angeles. A comprehensive review of the body was done, but we haven't proven. During this time, he's asking all the right questions. He's asking questions at every turn. That's an excellent indicator that he wants answers. He's not just trying to divert or dodge or avoid any subjects. Everything that comes up, he's asking questions about. That's good news. That's what we would hope to see in an investigator is somebody who's thorough, who asks all the questions and never settles. He always asks why, what, who, when, and where, and he tries to find the answer for it. That's good news. So far, we have a seemingly honorable, hardworking, authentic investigator who will not take I don't know for an answer. That's good. If she had been killed or rendered unconscious at another location, even though she was light, to carry a body up a steep ladder without damaging the body, it's not possible. I remember some bizarre- That incredulous expression there is accurate. Once again, it's showing synchronization between his emotions and his words, and that is true. Now, I haven't actually tested this. I don't have any way to even sort of test this, and I'm not sure that any people have, but to be able to do that sort of activity without leaving a single mark on her, even an abrasion of the skin, is incredibly unlikely. Not impossible, but very, very unlikely. Oftentimes, the simplest answer is the true one. Our thing where the web sleuths were trying to connect Elisa's case to some singer in Mexico, but all I can say is that he's not involved. I can understand how the web sleuths were. I don't know why he chooses that wording again. All I can say is, is that he's not involved, and that is just interesting to me. Who is involved? Was there an involved party? That goes back to his other earlier time where he has specific wording that pushed me towards that direction again. Why is he using this verbiage over and over again? It's interesting to me. Is it evidence? No, but there are now two instances of odd verbal patterns that push me into yet more questions. Trying to do the right things for the right reasons, just like we are. You get addicted to it, the challenge of putting pieces together, the excitement of being on the chase. But in this case, once again, a smile, but not reaching his eyes. This isn't an expression of genuine mirth. He's not having a joking time about this, but he still feels the need to put out a smile in regards to the excitement or similar emotion centered around that, but not enough for inauthenticity or authenticity. They were getting further and further away from the evidence. In the early stages of the investigation, when talking to the family, it wasn't divulged how serious her mental health was. As time went by... A little bit of action around the corner of his nose again, which is an indicator of disgust. He was likely pretty frustrated by the 
withholding of information centered around her mental condition during this time because that's very important information and would have helped the case immensely before. To have it come out this late in the actual investigation would be very frustrating and he likely had either contempt or frustration or anger centered around that showing itself in a mini expression of disgust. We learned from Elisa's sister that Elisa had the history of not taking her medication and several times previously that had caused her to have some type of mental breakdown. Now, some people still feel that there's some type of conspiracy to cut out portions of the video to protect the identity of the killer. I can't give a concrete answer on if our media relations or if the independent media outlets actually edited it for one reason or another. But I do know that any changes to the video weren't made by anybody at the hotel. The evidence is gonna speak for itself. So he's not saying I can't give a concrete answer on whether or not the video was edited, but he can give a concrete answer that nobody at the hotel edited it. And I didn't hear any fluctuation in his tone or pitch because it was audio during that time. It's hard to be able to read his face, but from what I can hear, he's not telling a lie here. Also, since he seems to be a fairly moral upstanding guy who is very synchronized with his emotions to words side of things, it's likely that his lies would stick out to us much more prevalently, but I didn't hear that there. And from what I could see, I didn't see that there, but he also didn't deny that it was edited. He just said that the hotel people couldn't have edited it. And there was nothing suspicious about the actual original hard drive video, which we have in our custody. And the only thing that I find interesting during this part is that his eyes are much wider than usual. They're straying from his baseline. This is a very intense expression that he has on his face. And it does raise a red flag to me. Why are his eyes so wide here? And why does he hold such steady gaze during this part where in other areas he would look down or around or to the side or whatnot much differently than this? And that does raise questions in my mind. Am I able to pursue those questions? No, I can't. I would love to, but I can't. But I do have them. I do have them here. So I understand if you do as well. She was in there, just missed her. It sucks. And I'm guessing you can see the emotion that it stirs up in me because. So you saw the smile that didn't reach his eyes when he said it sucks. This is also in relation to a person trying to cope with a negative experience, memory, emotion, so on and so forth. Many people will smile to help add that lightheartedness either to themselves or to the people that they're around. It's a coping mechanism and it's very, very common. But then after that, you could see the actual expression of somberness, sadness, regret, perhaps seeping into his face with lip compressions, downward pulling of the corners of his mouth, the relaxed setting of his eyelids and the positioning of his eyebrows. They all do say, I regret and I am sad. That makes sense. It's still synchronized. Regardless of what happened here, he regrets what happened. You don't forget. And in this case, we figured out what happened, but the answer hurt. So it's unfortunate that some people think there's a conspiracy, but there's not. Interesting, this little last blip here at the end struck me as strange when I watched the documentary for the first time. He's more or less confirming that there was no conspiracy theory here, but during that time he has that massive lip compression and then he looks down, he avoids gaze. Now we have seen these in other areas and they've never meant that he is lying. They've always meant that he's been ashamed or that he's biting back a negative emotion. So when I was watching this initially, my gut reaction was, oh, he might be lying there and that's odd and it trails off there and I was very unsatisfied by that. But after going back through and doing research and establishing a baseline as I should and instead of just going with my initial gut reaction, I do feel that he is being genuine here as well and what we see is still biting back of the negative emotions and the shame that goes along with a case like this. I still have questions and I'm sure you still have questions as well. I would love to be able to answer those questions, but no matter what I do, no matter how much footage I find, I will never be able to get to the truth because I don't have the opportunity to talk to him. 
I don't have the opportunity to direct specific questions, to evoke specific emotional responses and nonverbal responses to see if I can get to a point of him telling a lie or telling a truth in a way that could be detectable. I'm very limited here and everyone's limited on this. So from what I can see in my opinion that I can give is that I think that he is authentic. I think that he was a good detective and that he has a lot of shame for the areas that he failed during this. I don't think that there was anything that he could have done to prevent it. I just think that it was a very unfortunate incident all the way around. And his sense of failure comes from not finding her sooner, not from wanting to be able to prevent her death, but from being able to provide an answer sooner. And from a human level, I can understand that. The, the feeling of failure at something that you're supposed to do well. But that's my analysis. I hope that this is satisfactory for you. From this point on, I am leaving the case alone. The family needs to grieve, the friends need to grieve, and I feel like I've answered as best as I can the questions that I have. I hope you understand that decision. If you do have any other cases that you would like me to look at, please let me know in the comments below. I have a couple that are on my list, not the least of which is The Murder Among the Mormon, I believe is the name of the documentary, and also The Night Stalker. Both of those are on my list of non-verbal reads to do in the future. The Murder Among the Mormon should be coming out this Friday, so keep your eyes out for that. It should be a good one. And if you have any other suggestions to me, let me know in the comments below. I'm also going to be continuing the Just Deduce It series and Body Language Evolution series as well, just to help add some variety. If you liked this video, go ahead and consider hitting the like button, hit subscribe if you would like to see more videos like this, ding the bell if you want to see them sooner. Again, if you want to support the channel beyond just those things, you have all of those links in the description below and I appreciate every single one of them. But, but, without further ado, that's all that I've got for the day. My name is Logan and you have been oh so awesome as you always are. And I will see you in the next video. Cheers guys.